It is my pleasure to introduce you to our guest speaker today, Professor Mark Jacobson. Mark is, a, Mark is a professor in the Stanford Civil and Environmental Engineering Department, um, where the Civil and Environmental Engineering Department now resides in both the Stanford School of Engineering and the new school, uh, Stanford Dewar School of Sustainability. Mark teaches our EXEIT 100 course, which you can view from within our webinar interface by selecting the link. Mark has been a champion of clean renewable energy and working toward ensuring air quality for all for many decades. Welcome, Mark. And with that, I'm going to hand the webinar over to you. Thank you very much, Anita, for your kind introduction. And so I'm going to talk today about uh, transitioning cities, states, countries, and the world entirely to clean renewable energy. And so I'm trying to get, to, here we go. Um, and so I'm gonna make the point that we don't need miracle technologies to solve the problems of air pollution, global warming, and energy security. Uh, we have 95% of the technologies we need. But let me first start out, you know, what are these problems that we're trying to solve? And so, as I've just mentioned, I, you know, in my opinion, we need to solve three major problems. There's air pollution, which causes on the order of 7 million deaths per year prematurely uh, worldwide and hundreds of millions more illnesses. And this costs the world today, uh, based on statistical cost of life and morbidity, about $30 trillion per year. Global warming is a rising problem that's already seeing severe consequences and is estimated to cost another $30 trillion per year or so by 2050. The third problem we're trying to solve is energy insecurity. Fossil fuels are limited resources. They will run out eventually, and we need replacement of them in place by then. Otherwise, we'll see economic, social, and political instability. In addition, the uh, many countries depend on fossil fuels from other countries, and so those countries that have the source of fossil fuels can often uh, cause disruption, uh, as we're seeing in Europe right now, uh, and that results in energy insecurity. Uh, another type of energy insecurity is the fact that uh, fossil fuels, if, they're, if they have to be transported over the ocean to islands, for example, that results in very high electricity prices. That's a type of energy insecurity. Anywhere, anywhere there are several other types of energy insecurity problems. These are all drastic problems that require immediate and drastic solutions. So our solution since 2009, when we developed our first energy plan, was to electrify all energy as much as we can and then provide the electricity, and there's also some direct heat, with just wind, water, and solar power. And we define wind, water, and solar as onshore and offshore wind, solar photovoltaics on rooftops and in power plants, concentrated solar, geothermal electricity and heat, hydroelectricity, and small amounts of tidal and wave power. And if we electrify all energy, that means there are four major energy sectors. There's electricity, transportation, heating and cooling of buildings and industry. And so, for example, to electrify transportation, we go to primarily battery electric vehicles, but also some hydrogen fuel cell vehicles for long distance transport, like long distance ships, planes, uh, trains and trucks. Uh, for buildings, we would go to uh, electric heat pumps primarily for heating individual buildings for air heating, water heating, and also air conditioning. Heat pumps use one-fourth the energy as natural gas. Uh, there's also what we call district heating, where instead of heating individual buildings with individual heaters and coolers, we would uh, have centralized heaters and coolers and, and then transmit uh, heat and cold through water pipes to buildings, uh, like is done around the world. Uh, in the United States, about 7% of the US is already under district heating, but in some Scandinavian countries, for example, it's up to 50% is up, up under district heating. And we provide that district heat and cold either with heat pumps or with direct geothermal heat or solar heat. Uh, for industry, we would electrify that primarily with electric arc furnaces, induction furnaces, resistance furnaces, dielectric heaters, electron beam heaters. These are existing technologies. And we would power the electricity uh, in all these cases with just wind, water, and solar. Of course, we will need storage for such a transition. We need electricity storage, some heat storage, cold storage, and there'll be some hydrogen for some applications. So we already have 
a lot of electricity storage options. There's concentrated solar power with storage, pumped hydroelectric uh, power, with store, which is a storage technology, uh, existing hydroelectric dams, which are basically big batteries, batteries themselves, flywheels, compressed air storage, and gravitational storage with solid masses. Uh, you know, some of these like gravitational storage are emerging technologies, but you know, batteries exist, dams exist, pumped hydro storage exists, concentrated solar power ex exists, flywheels exist. These are all, for, for the most part, existing technologies, and they can be, they have been implemented around the world. For heating and cooling, water tank storage uh, is, is omnipresent everywhere uh, for both hot and cold water, uh, storage in ice, storage in underground, in boreholes, water pits, and aquifers. For seasonal storage, that's a way to store heat seasonally between summer and winter, and also in building materials. These are all existing technologies. And then we'll store some hydrogen. So what are the, uh, people hear a lot about hydrogen these days. So I just wanna say, in my opinion, what are the good and bad sources and uses of hydrogen? Well, the only good source of hydrogen, in my belief, is green hydrogen. That's hydrogen produced by electrolysis from wind, water, solar, electricity. What is not good is hydrogen produced from natural gas or coal or even nuclear. So natural gas, um, when natural gas produces hydrogen, 96% of all hydrogen today is produced from what's called steam methane reforming of natural gas. And that's called gray hydrogen. If you add what's called carbon capture to gray hydrogen, you get blue hydrogen. But carbon capture is not useful. It does not, it only takes out carbon from, the, from an exhaust stream, uh, does not take out any other air pollutants. It takes 30% more energy than if you don't have carbon capture. So that means in the case of this natural gas, you need 30% more mining and transport and uh, refining of the natural gas, and therefore 30% more air pollution, 30% more upstream leaks. And the capture uh, efficiency is not that great. It's not uh, 90 or 95% uh, for that type of capture. It's on the order of 60 to 80%. But in general, carbon capture attached to coal plants, for example, can be, the efficiency can be down to 20%. In any case, you're increasing air pollution uh, with any type of carbon capture, especially when it's added to, uh, including when it's added to uh, hydrogen production. Uh, black and brown hydrogen are from coal. We don't want that. Uh, nuclear electricity, using that to produce hydrogen. Uh, we are going to fit, we're phasing out nuclear. There's hardly any growth. In fact, there's less nuclear produced last year than in 2006, so that is not growing at all. And it takes so long to put up new nuclear reactors uh, that they're not an option going forward. And I'll mention that a little bit later. Uh, turquoise hydrogen is from methane, methane pyrolysis, again, from natural gas, we don't want that. What are the good uses of hydrogen? Well, as I mentioned, long distance uh, transport, like aircraft, ships, trains, and trucks for long distance, also military vehicles with using fuel cells in all cases, uh, in industry for ammonia and steel manufacturing, and also for electricity and heat, uh, using fuel cells for remote, remote microgrids. So isolated grids like in Alaska or uh, it could be in Africa or anywhere, uh, if you need both electricity and heat, which often you do, uh, you can get that from a fuel cell. Um, some grid electricity, but combined with batteries. So having mostly batteries on the grid, but some fuel cells can help out in some cases for grid electricity. But we do not want to use hydrogen for passenger vehicles to heat buildings. You don't want to mix it hydrogen with natural gas and pipes and we don't want to burn the hydrogen uh, because it produces air pollutants. And for most grid electricity, we'll use batteries and other types of storage. Well, okay, so why not, I talked about wind, water, solar, but why not carbon capture, direct air capture, small modular nuclear reactors, bioenergy, non-hydrogen electrofuels, or geoengineering? Well, several of these, compo several of these uh, technologies they just increase air pollution. Uh, I show photos here of air pollution in, in the 1950s uh, in Los Angeles. And I show a photo I actually took on February 19th, 2023 of Los Angeles. We still have a lot of air pollution. In fact, there is a study that came out this week uh, worldwide. There are only five countries of the world uh, that do not have uh, harmful air quality in terms of particles. And so there's pollution rampant around the world. It kills 7 million people each year. This is a problem that's continuing. And 
carbon capture, direct air capture, bioenergy, uh, electrofuels, geoengineering, they all increase air pollution. Why? Well, as I mentioned, carbon capture doesn't uh, take out any air pollutants from the air, but it needs more energy. So 30% more energy. If that energy comes from a fossil fuel, you directly have more air pollution. If that energy comes from wind, water, and solar, well, that prevents the wind, water, and solar from replacing a fossil fuel power plant where it could otherwise eliminate not only the air pollution from that uh, power plant, uh, it could eliminate the mining of the fuel, it could eliminate the fossil fuel infrastructure as well, and it removes more CO2 than the carbon capture it would. So there's, a, there's an opportunity cost. 75% of all carbon dioxide captured today is also used for enhanced oil recovery. During that process, not only do we get more oil to burn, but 40% of the CO2 that was captured goes right back to the air. So carbon capture is a complete waste for solving any of these problems. It's an opportunity cost, so we do not want to spend on that. Direct air capture is the same as carbon capture, except we're taking carbon dioxide out of the air directly. Again, you need energy, you need equipment. That If that energy comes from fossil fuels, you have more air pollution directly. If it comes from renewables, then you're preventing those renewables from displacing fossil fuels there by increasing air pollution in comparison with replacing the fossil fuels. What about bioenergy? You burn it. Uh, biofuel, there's biofuels, which are a replacement like uh, ethanol and uh, biodiesel replacing gasoline and diesel respectively. You're still burning it. It takes a lot of energy to produce it. So that energy releases a lot of carbon. In the case of ethanol, for example, you can't pipe it around. You have to train truck and barge it around. So that means more diesel emissions, more air pollution, more global warming emissions. So the carbon balance on bioenergy is some studies show that there's a slight reduction of carbon compared to gasoline, diesel. Some studies show there's actually more carbon emitted. So it's, we're not getting anything close to zero. Uh, we're getting what we are getting close to zero with electrifying everything. Just for example, photosynthesis for producing a biofuel is 1% efficient. Electric uh, solar panels are 20% efficient. So you get 20 times more energy for the same land when you put solar panels on that land versus growing a bio crop. In addition, an electric vehicle uses one fourth the energy as a gasoline or, or ethanol vehicle. So a solar power powering an electric vehicle uses 1 80th the land to go the same distance as a biofuel crop powering an internal combustion engine vehicle. Uh, electrofuels, non-hydrogen electrofuels, these are fuels where carbon dioxide is used with other chemicals and processed to produce a replacement for gasoline. So not only does that, I told you that car, to get that carbon dioxide, you use carbon capture, which increases air pollution, first of all, but then you're creating a fuel that you're going to burn just like gasoline, so you create the same amount of pollution. It's argued that this reduces the carbon <clears throat> footprint. However, it doesn't, as I mentioned, it does not decrease the air pollution. And because it takes so much energy to make this fuel, and it takes a lot of energy to capture the carbon, you're hardly reducing any carbon from this as well. Uh, geoengineering is basically spraying pollution. One of the major, solar radiation management is one of the main geoengineering techniques. That's basically spraying pollutant particles into the stratosphere where they can affect the ozone layer and also reduce photosynthesis affecting crops at the surface. But what's the big problem with doing this? The goal is to uh, reflect more sunlight to cool the surface of the earth. The big problem is it makes people complacent and it allows fossil fuels to continue, it allows air pollution to continue and grow. It allows energy insecurity to continue and grow. And it has multiple side effects. It doesn't solve any problem. It only masks temperature, it doesn't even uh, address other aspects of climate change associated with the increase of fossil fuels. So, and then finally, small modular nuclear reactors. Well, conventional nuclear reactors have a big problem. Uh, new ones, it takes 17 to 21 years between planning and operation for a new nuclear power plant uh, in, in North America and Europe. Uh, there's a plant in Georgia. It's taking, it's on year 17 and 18 for two reactors and it's already laid a, a enough concrete for a sidewalk between Miami and Seattle. It costs $34 billion for 2.2 gigawatts. That's, that's about $15.2 million a megawatt compared with $1 million a megawatt for wind, new wind and solar. And so it's 15 times more the capital cost, about eight times the electricity cost. And it takes 
17 to 21 years, as I mentioned, versus one to three years for wind or solar. We need to solve 80% of the problem within seven years by 2030 and 100% of the problem between 2035 and 2050. If we can't, and small modular reactors won't even be available for testing until 2030. They've already been studied for 10 years. So they have the same delay problem. Their cost problem is similar to, to the conventional reactors. And plus there's energy security risk of nuclear weapons proliferation risk, uh, waste issues, meltdown risk, uh, uranium mining, un lung cancer risks, and also CO2. There's a CO2 emissions associated with nuclear. It's about nine to 37 times the CO2 emissions per kilowatt hour as wind. Most of that's due to the fact that it takes so long to build it, you're waiting, you're burning fuels fossil fuels in the background. Okay, so let's let's move on. I want to summarize really quickly. This is a just example of district heating. This is Stanford University where I work, um, replaced a natural gas cogeneration plant uh, with this, which provided 80% of the campus electricity and heat with this fourth generation district heating and cooling system. They laid out 35 miles of cold water pipes, 35 miles of hot water pipes, and that, uh, and now provides 100% of the heating and cooling of the university uh, with this district heating and cooling system and bought sufficient solar, 160 megawatts, uh, to power not only the system, but all the electricity for the campus. So it was the first campus in the world to be 100% renewable for electricity, heating, and cooling. This is another type of district heating system. This is underground borehole system in Okotoks, Canada, where there are 52 homes that have solar collectors on their garages or on the roofs of their garages on the top left where a glycol solution is heated up during the summer and tra transferred by pipe to this uh, building on the right, where the heat is transferred to water, the water is piped underground and sent through boreholes to the soil. The heat is stored six months, up to six months, and then in the winter when the snow is on the ground, like in the bottom left, uh, everything is run in reverse. Uh, so to provide 100% of the wintertime heating at less than $1 a kilowatt hour of heat storage, which compares with about 100 to 200 dollars a kilowatt hour for electricity storage. We can transition individual homes and buildings. I just want to say something. This is my own home. In 2017, I built it with no gas on the property. I have solar on the roof, uh, batteries in the garage, electric cars. Uh, these are electric heat pumps that I don't have time to go into, but they transfer they transfer heat rather than produce it. And as a result, they use one fourth the energy as natural gas. Here's a heat pump water heater that uses one fourth the energy of it as a natural gas water heater. An electric induction cooktop stove. It boils water in half the time as gas. And you know these all these technologies are really efficient. So over the five, first five years of energy use, I produced 120 percent of all my home and vehicle energy needs with the solar on the roof. I had no electric bill, no natural gas bill or gasoline bill. And I received money back for the extra electricity from the community choice aggregation utility that I subscribed to. But I also avoided a, a gas hookup fee of about $6,000. This shows a range for typical homes and gas pipes of about $10,000. You don't need two forms of energy in your home or building. Uh, electricity does everything that gas does, but does it better. So after all the savings were accounted for, it's a five-year payback time with subsidies that are also available in California and the United States and about 10 years without subsidies. The, the solar is warranted for 25 years. So right now it's free energy for the next uh, 20 years. Okay, can we transition the world for all purposes uh, to wind, water, and solar? So we did studies of 145 countries in all 50 states. Let me just summarize the results quickly. The end use demand among all these countries in 2018 was 13 trillion watts or terawatts. That's expected to go up to 20.4 terawatts by 2050. But if we electrify everything and provide the electricity with wind, water, solar, that goes down 56.4% to 8.9 terawatts for five reasons. One is that battery electric and hydrogen fuel cell vehicles use less energy, much less energy than, than internal combustion engine vehicles. The electrifying industry uses less energy than fossil fuel industry. Uh, using heat pumps for air and water heating uh, reduce energy requirements 13.6% across all energy sectors. And then 11.3% of all energy worldwide is used to mine, transport, and refine fossil fuels and uranium. Uh, this goes out the door. We don't need that mining anymore uh, for those purposes. So that's 11.3%. And then we think we can get another 6.6% efficiency improvements beyond business as usual. So that 56% reduction 
you know, significantly makes it easier to, to provide enough energy for the world with just wind, water, solar. This shows a timeline of the same information from 2020 to 2050. If we don't do anything, we go along the top line, but if we electrify and provide the electricity with WWS, we go down those five shades of colors to the 100% WWS line, and then we provide that wind, water, solar with onshore and offshore wind, et cetera, in the mix as shown. This shows an 80% transition by 2030 and 100% by 2050, which is needed to avoid 1.5 degrees or more global warming since the 1850 to 1900 period. However, if we can solve 80% of the problem by 2030, there's no reason we shouldn't be able to solve uh, 100% by 2035, which is or really should be our goal. We have 95% of the technologies that we need right now. And well, you might ask, is there enough land to do this? Uh, so for those 135, 145 country plans, we find that, well, we, we don't need new land for offshore wind, tidal and wave power, or rooftop PV. We're not adding new hydro in any of these plans. Geothermal additions are small. So the new land required is for utility photovoltaics plus concentrated solar power, which we call footprint. So that worldwide is about 0.17% of the world land will be needed. And then the spacing between onshore wind turbines, which can be used for farming, ranching, open space, or even some of the some of the PV. So that's about 0.36%. So a total of 0.53%. So around half of 1% of the world's land. In the US, that would be about 0.84%. In comparison, the fossil fuel industry occupies about 1.3% of the US land area. So we think we'll go down. Can we keep the grid stable? Yes, we can. We've done grid stability analyses, and not only for all the 145 countries broken into or divided into 24 world regions, but also all US states. Here, show, here for example, is the continental US, a grid stability analysis, finding that we can keep the grid stable uh, every 30 seconds for two years here uh, with just wind, water, solar storage and using demand response. What's the cost of energy with such a uh, conversion and keeping the grid stable? Well, the capital cost worldwide is around $62 trillion. This is what I call the worldwide Green New Deal cost. In the US, it's about $9 trillion. And in China, it's about $13 trillion. But what's really more important is the annual cost of energy uh, comparison with business as usual. Today, worldwide, we spend about 11 to $12 trillion per year on energy. That's expected to go up to $18 trillion per year by 2050. The health costs around $33.6 trillion per year in 2050, the climate costs around 32 trillion. That's a total social cost of $83 trillion. If we, if we go to wind, water, solar for everything, we eliminate the health and climate costs of energy and our energy requirements go down 56% and the cost per unit energy goes down another 15%. So we go from 17.8 trillion in the energy cost to 6.6 .6 trillion or 63% lower. And our total social cost goes down 92%. These are phenomenal reductions uh, due to going to wind, water, solar. The and finally, I just wanna say something about uh, policy. We developed our first energy plan in 2009. Uh, and it was really a world plan without looking at individual countries. And the conclusion was well, it's technically and economically possible to transition the world by 2030 to wind, water, and solar, but for social and political reasons, a more likely transition is by 2050 with most 80% by 2030. This turned out to be the basis for the Green New Deal, this, this scientific study. But since then, there are now 62 countries that have committed to 100% renewables in the electric power sector. Only one country, Denmark, has committed to 100% renewables in all energy sectors. There are, in the US, there are 19 states and territories and districts that have committed to 100% uh, renewables in the electric power sector. Again, this is, these are not all sectors. And I'm just gonna run through these really quick to get to the end. Um, there are 180 plus cities and counties in the US that have committed to 100% renewables. Uh, these, these are really important. The blue ones are the bigger cities. There are over 400 international companies that have committed, included, including 100, sorry, eight of the 10 biggest companies of the world, which are the ones in blue. Uh, and there are also countries and, state, and states that are actually already at 100%. On the left, very left, there are nine countries that actually generate 100% of their electricity already from wind, water, solar. Uh, the middle three countries generate 91% or more 
of their electricity from wind, water, solar. Most of these are generating primarily with hydropower. Uh, Kenya is geothermal. On the right, uh, South Dakota is actually generating 126% of its consumed energy with wind, water, solar, with 77% wind and the rest hydro. And it also uh, produces fossil fuels, so it exports the difference. Washington State's at 98.5%, Scotland's around 91%, as is Montana. So these are all good, uh, this is all good news. So just to summarize, uh, we also think we can create jobs with a transition, 28 million more long-term full-time jobs than lost. We require only 0.53% of land for such a transition worldwide. We'd avoid 7 million deaths per year. We'd slow then reverse global warming. We think we can keep the grid stable with 100% wind, water, and solar. Energy costs are 63% lower. Annual energy plus health plus climate costs are 92% lower than with fossil fuels. And finally, for more information, as Anita said, there's an online course that discusses this in a lot more depth. Uh, there's a new book called No Miracles Needed. Uh, that is a layman's book summarizing that, that we don't need miracle technologies to transition. It gives us a, an example of how, how we can transition. And we have individual state and country and city plans at the third uh, link. And there is actually an infographic map where you can click on a map and upload each of these uh, plans if you're interested. And, and happy to answer any questions that you might have. Thank you very much. Mark, thank you so much. There's so much to be covered here. Um, this is so important. And um, I just wanna, you know, I'm looking at all the questions and, and I have to just make this uh, known out to our, our audience that many of your questions Mark teaches in his XEIT 100 course. Um, and he goes into deep detail. That course is the foundation course for our energy innovation and emerging technologies program. Um, and it's, comp it's comprehensive. It covers all the technologies, uh, policy, uh, impacts to humanity and uh, to people all around the globe. Um, I have one question here that I, I, I know you address in the course, but it would be interesting to, to hear your answer at this point with the transition of what's happening with hydrogen. Um, the question, question is specifically for using hydrogen in uh, passenger vehicles uh, versus uh, straight electric vehicles. Yeah, so the reason we don't want to use hydrogen in passenger vehicles, it's, it's not because it's not clean. It actually is clean if we use green hydrogen in passenger vehicles, it's almost as clean as uh, using battery electric. And the only, the difference is though, you need about two to three times the number of wind turbines or solar panels to run that hydrogen fuel cell vehicle versus a battery electric vehicle. So it's, it's, so you'll need more land and you'll, there's a little more emissions in building these turbines. And so it just makes the transition more difficult. So if we wanna be really efficient we need to focus the hydrogen on useful applications. It turns out when you get to larger and larger vehicles, the efficiency turns and the hydrogen fuel cell vehicles become more efficient than battery electrics when you get to like long distance aircraft and ships, just because otherwise you're carrying, you're spending a lot of energy just carrying around batteries. And that's, that, that's the case where you want to use the hydrogen for those long distance applications. Great. Um, we have one minute left and um, I want to thank you and thank everybody who attended today. And uh, if you have other questions, you can always reach out to us through our email, which is on the EIT program website. Um, and um, you can see on your screen, if you would like to enroll on the course, you should be able to select one of the links there to uh, learn about Mark's course. Mark, I wanna thank you again um, for joining us today and giving us this so very important and excellent uh, webinar. Um, and I wanna thank everybody else who took the time to join us today from wherever you are in, in the world. Um, it has been an absolute pleasure and we hope you all have a great rest of your day.